Brian Scriker. Yo, episode 196, we made a podcast. Hey, 196. Absolutely, we back in the trap where we started at. We bringing back UFC C's today, you know what I mean? There's a lot of stuff going on. The 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 Darren Till fight got canceled. That you know? does. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Till, <laughs> Till versus Variety got canceled. <laughs> Variety, Variety. Darren Till is going to fight Marco Variety. It's Vittori. It <laughs> got canceled, you know what I'm saying? Big stuff going on, you know what I mean? Doing Darren Till and Marco Verratti is canceled. Oh my God! And, C- and 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 Caesar finds out from me first. That's a big deal in the okay. UFC. What? Uh, that's a big deal in the UFC world. And then we're also going to get into some random soccer stuff. International break boring. I don't even give like. I didn't even know that the U.S. men's national team didn't qualify for the Olympics. I found out after. I didn't even know they were – I didn't even know that was going down. I'm not even trying to be mean. Like, I mean, I'll be, I'll be all the way honest with you. I kind of would have watched it if I knew it had been an Olympic qualifier because I watched the last Olympics uh, soccer. I, I would have I seen to see what's good, you well, know. And I, and I historically, I like watching our Honduras kind of put on work on America. They kind of do that a lot. The Honduras go hard. Well, you're yeah. uh, going and spoiling the whole thing. But um, what's the Oh, name? yeah, because no one knows. Go ahead. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> Already? Already. Um, yeah, I didn't even know they didn't qualify, but um, I guess that happened. I found out after. We're going to talk a little bit about Champions League coming up next week and um, a little bit about this Qatar situation going on. Maybe even in protests in Qatar. And I, I, I got something to say about that. You know what I'm saying? Even though even though BN played us over the four years, they have played us out. You know what I mean? I'm still riding. Okay. And uh, maybe uh, maybe we'll have a somewhat of an announcement at the end of the episode potentially. But uh, <laughs> yeah, see, don't play with me. Uh, so much for 17 minute episode, and it, it's probably gonna be 17 minutes of UFC talking. I'm beginning to be honest with you. Well, um, that, that's what I'm hoping for because I'm excited for UFC C's. It's been a while. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You don't even you don't even text me and Tark in the group about random USC stuff no more. I know because I feel like you guys don't appreciate it. Caesar, stop! First of I all, I just like, keep it to I, myself. <laughs> first of all, I respond whenever you talk about it. I respond. I have no outlet. I be I be alone in this world. Well, Caesar, I got no outlets for a lot of stuff too. So just welcome to life. And also, when you talk about it, I do respond. And also, I'm the one that told you about Darren Till, Marco Verratti. You weren't the one that told me about Vertori. I, I told you about Wonder Boy and Verratti. I told you. What do you mean Wonder Boy and Verratti? What are you talking about? Hey, that He's not name. fighting Wonder Boy. <laughs> What's his, that's not his name. He's fighting Kevin Holland. Anyways. So. Wait, wait. Who's, who's Wonder Boy? Wonder Boy is Stephen Thompson, dude that fought Tyron Woodley that we watched like four years ago. The, the skinny snake-looking that, dude. That's the same, that's the same guy. No, Vertori is like a big buff no. Italian dude with sleeve tats. No, Darren Till is no Wonder Darren Boy. Till and Steve Wonder Boy did fight each other though, and you watched and you said it was mad boring. Yeah, well that's <laughs> Darren Till. It was mad boring. Yeah, Darren Till is Wonder Boy. No, one's yeah. from Tennessee, one's from England. One's he, he's Scouse, Wonder Boy. One's from one's from Memphis. <laughs> he's Wonder Boy now. How about that? <laughs> Sure, man. Whatever, whatever makes you win your point. So don't don't make me start singing "Wonder Boy" by Tenacious D. But anyway, sing go ahead. huh? Sing it. No, no, I'm okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. What's going that. on in UFC? It's, it's cracking out here. A lot of things happen. I guess from the top, uh, Francis Ngannou became the UFC heavyweight champion, uh, just decimating Stipe Miocic, who I thought one of the most annoying things ever is. Whenever they talk about uh, UFC fighters and like, oh, it's hard to understand them, you know, they're pretty like messed up about people that speak different languages. Um, and the, the previous press conference, which was, I think, two years, three years ago, they fought two years ago. Ngannou's from, well, is, orig- is, orig- is from France. That's where he came from. Um, uh, and then um, Stipe's from o- Ohio, but his family's Croatian. I don't understand anything Stipe says. I don't know. But in Gano, I understand. I know what he's saying. Like, I get it. Yes, it's broken English, but I understand it. And everybody was like, oh, well, the, the best thing was the comments was like, can we get subtitles under Stipe also? Because that dude talks so fast. I have no idea what he's saying. And he's a firefighter in Ohio. Um, anyway, so Stipe, um, a lot of the talk was that Stipe was going to win once again because all, St- all Francis's is just 
a big, strong guy who throws hands. He's not very intelligent. He's just big. That's what they were saying a lot. And they were saying Steve A's very calculated and technically gifted and all this. The minute I first saw them stand together, I'm like, damn, you're about to lose. And then they weighed in. This dude weighed in. Stipe weighed in at like 240. Francis Ngannou weighed in two pounds under the heavyweight limit at 263 pounds. That means he had to lose weight to make heavyweight. So this is a big guy. <laughs> like, and I don't care how much you wrestle. And Bam, maybe you can attest to this. It's always a difference. If even if you're wrestling, if you're wrestling someone that's 20 pounds heavier than you, it doesn't matter if someone's really good or not. It still requires a lot. Like it takes a lot out of you. And it can be, it's not like wrestling someone who's the same size as you that doesn't know how to wrestle really. So yeah. it's been two and a half years since then. Uh Stipe's knocked out four people in a row in the first round. And none of his fights in then have completed a full fight. They've all been within uh, a minute, two minutes, a minute, two minutes. Immediately, he fought wrestlers, everything. You name it, he beat them all. Um, and, of course, he had to take the longest path in the whole world to get back. Other people get rematches and they haven't won in four years. I mm, wonder who that is. Uh, <laughs> so, Francis wins. I mean, I mean, from the beginning, like, just – it was just ridiculous. I, I kind of wish it was the days where I got to make my friends watch it with me because it was so fun. Like, it was just like, wow, like, this is not fair. <laughs> um, destroyed him, uh, knocked him down one time, and then he got back up and then beat him again. And everybody's big moment came. Stipe tried to wrestle him. Uh, Francis did – it looked, Francis did what it looked like he's been doing – waiting for two and a half years. Trained wrestling. He just dropped his hips, spreads his legs out, and then just uh, uh, prevented the the shot, the double, the double. He prevented the double. Like, just looks like he's been training for this. I mean, you give someone two and a half years, they're going to learn something. And he took it seriously. You could tell he took it seriously. He's about his craft. He even looks bigger than before, like more like in shape. So, yeah, he wins. And I think this is the best thing ever for UFC. Now the UFC has three African-based champions, African-born champions. They have Israel Adesanya, who was born in Nigeria. You have um, – Kamaru Usman, who's also born in Nigeria, and you have um, Ngannou, who's born in Cameroon. So now you have three African-based champions pushing for what I hope soon is the first UFC Africa event that needs to happen. It's overdue. The fact that we have... Why would you want them to have a UFC event in Africa when uh, Dana White is racist? Well, I just want it because I, I want... I just want the sport to be there because I want to give... I want more opportunities for people. I want it to be more opportunities. Uh, well, I'm I'm pretty sure MMA is in Africa. Yes, but it's really, really low grade, very low. No hot, no big events go there. There's never been a major event that's hosted in Africa before. Although there's a bunch of lo- local regional scenes that, especially in South Africa, they have a big re- they have like a big regional scene. But it'd be cool to see a big event go there. The UFC's been to Qatar. The UFC's been to P- Japan. They've been to everywhere. Why is Africa? Why is the African continent excluded from that? No, I don't. I don't want you. Just because there. Africa. Just because there's people that have had events in Africa doesn't mean that they can't have an event there. So I think you should be allowed to have an event there. Why not? Like, th- these these fighters are all asking for it. They want to go play in their home. They want to go play in front of their people and their family. They should be allowed to. I think that would be cool if they did that. There, well, I, I mean, as someone who is a, a not really – African-American, into, yes. Who's not really into Dana White like that. I don't want Dana White making more money off Africa. And I don't either, but I still would want these guys who kind of came – this crazy journey to get here where they are to be able to defend their belt at like, you know, essentially the home continent in front of people that are, you know, more than like, go, oh, I'm going to go fight in Nevada again, Nevada. Maybe they want to do that. You know, Muhammad Ali got to have one of the biggest events over there. Like there's got, there's been events in the past, so it, it should happen again. Yeah, but Muhammad Ali's from Kentucky. I know he is, but I'm saying they've, they've had events over there, big fighting events again before. Why can't they do it again? I'd like to, for them to make their own uh, big, uh, they US. have their own scene. Well, make that bigger and have it have. Why don't you have these uh, dudes, uh, the, uh, Kamaru and Izzy and <laughs> I was about to say so. Wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> why don't they? Why don't they get together and make their own joint and have them joints in Africa cracking? I don't want Dana White going to the continent making bread. I think you're. I think you're asking a lot of independent contractors to, well, well, especially I'll, someone like, especially like someone like Ngana who talked about the story of him just immigrating to the United States and getting to France um, uh, and getting from emigrating from Cameroon, um, getting arrested in Spain, going through Morocco, doing everything he can to make an opportunity for himself. The, the one time in life he finally started to make something good and wants to, to, to do. And which the cool thing about Ngano, I don't know what the other fighters do, 
But I like Ngannou the most because he does a ton of work there, and he goes back there a lot. He built an entire two academies in Cameroon. Um, he does work over there. He trains with them. He, like, teaches the people. He's, t- he's, he's been talking about the next generation. This is no disrespect to Israel and those guys who, have, who, now, who live in New Zealand and Kamara who lives in Florida. Ngannou is really going back there and, like, doing the thing, and I can respect that. You know, that's, that's something that you, you don't see every day. And, and, you know, he's someone that always talks about where he came from because, like, obviously, he's had a lasting impact in his entire life, and it's part of his structure. So, good on him. Well, yeah, that's dope. I, want, I don't want Dana White making more money off Africa. And I'm down for that. I agree. I think there needs, it'd be cool if there's a way to do that, but, you know, that's not what this episode's about. So, uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, Dana White's one of the worst people on this entire planet, and unfortunately, UFC is a massive monopoly. When your UFC's competition, they buy you out. Pride, uh, uh, um, uh, it, 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 I forgot the other name, but there's, there's a bunch of organizations they just bought out and they absolved the fighter. So but Bellator is still out there, right? Yes, Bellator is out there because Bellator luckily has too much money now, um, and Bellator has been doing good recently. Now they're on Showtime. Um, they signed a massive deal with CBS. So all their fights are on Paramount Plus and on Showtime app. So you can watch it on Showtime app, on Showtime TV. The last time Bellator was on Showtime was when it was my favorite event back in the day, when they had, like, Kimbo and all that. So that's cool. They're back on Showtime. Um, well, ho- hopefully, maybe – I'm I'm more down for Bellator to go uh, suck the life out of Africa, not Dana White. I'm, I'm down, too. I'm down, too. I'm, I agree with that. Um, they probably would go there before UFC anyway, just because – they're a little bit more humanitarian about their fights. Ask any of the people that fought for the UFC and fight for the Bellator. They say the big difference is, like, now they're respected. That's, like, important. They're treated as a human being. So, um, also, the, the Bellator was given fighters monthly stipends during a the time they weren't fighting because Bellator didn't come back immediately and start trying to fight whatever. They actually held off, and employees, including fighters, were getting stipends per month. So, regardless, that's something better than nothing that some of these other guys are getting. So, uh, the big news is Ngana won, and leading up to that, now it's the conversation of who's the next opponent. After immediately after the fight, John, I mean during the fight, John Jones is on a tweeting spree as usual. I think he's usually sitting there with a henny, henny bottle and just cracking off tweets at every fight. But I don't get mad at that because I'll say it again. Okay, I get annoyed of it because even though Connor does the same thing, it's just annoying overall. Like because. Me, MMA media is so whack that, like, they use the tweet as, like, some big, like, news headline. I'm like, it's almost like the Trump thing. Like, the tweet is, like, their, their, their declaration to people. And it's – I really hate that. Like, I don't like the platform being used for that. Like, I think it's really whack. So, the most annoying thing is after every single fight, Connor would be like, see you soon, boy, or whatever. See you soon, or whatever. And I'm like, you haven't fought in four years, but okay, man. Caesar, and, Caesar want Twitter just to be for ambiguous tweets like it's 2000. I want it to be emo style like your boy does, or just <laughs> yeah. like I, I, I want it to be subtweet nation. It's fun to sit Caesar, there and try to riddle who it's about. Check the follower list. Like hmm, what the Caesar, fuck? Caesar's still doing ambiguous tweets. And so <laughs> sometimes I get really excited to do it. I'm like, yo, I can't wait to write this damn ambiguous ass tweet. It's so dope. <laughs> and I get upset that it's always my most popping tweet. It's like I get the most likes and retweets out there. I'm like, you guys are really in your feels too, huh? Okay, people. Respect. Okay. <laughs> look, look at this guy talking about what he don't want Twitter to be about. And he's still doing the same. F boy. F boy. Shit. F boy. Not F boy. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just passionate person. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so John anyways, Jones, John Jones, Jones starts tweeting. tweeting about, "I'm excited for this. Let's do it. Like I want to fight." And then at the well, pro fight press conference, wait, John Jones is saying jo- he John Jones help. has vacated his light heavyweight belt. Well, he wait, he's talking about fighting Ngannou. Ngannou, or Ngannou? yes, okay, Ngannou. John John Jones won 15 straight heavyweight titles defenses and re- retired the belt. And now yeah. there's other people fighting for the light heavyweight belt. 15? What, what, what he, he's fight been a for? champion since he was 22 years old, I believe, and he's 32 now. Why so does he, he like, want to fight still? You won it 15 times? Because, which I'm about to tell you later, we kind of find out how much he actually made during that time. And it's pretty shocking if you think about it. Uh, so John Jones uh, wants to fight, but his thing is that he's now apparently saying he's sitting at around 240 pounds. He used to be a 205 pounder, so he's big now. He's a big dude. Uh, he's been training for heavyweight, but he's saying he's not going to just go in there and fight for free. Uh, he said he was fighting for, for – uh, he was underpaid his entire life. 
um, including times in which he was sponsored by Nike and Gatorade as the first athletes, still was getting eight hundred thousand to a per fight, a one million, two million average per fight, which he thought was crazy considering if the UFC was selling at one one million pay per view events at seventy dollars a pop, him only get a million that is pretty bonkers if you think about it. Um, and his recent comparison is that he got in an argument with the UFC about Dante Wilder, the boxer. Dante Wilder and Tyson Fury fought. It only sold 800K, but they both got 25 million, which is still, I mean, that's not, I don't even think that was like 35% of the purse, like of the, of the, of the pay-per-view event. So, I mean, it's good money. Like they got great money and they're the name and they're the reason people watched it. UFC um, apparently wants to offer him, uh, uh, originally wanted to offer him one to 2 million. And this fight, which is, I think would be massive. It's probably one of the biggest events in UFC history if they do Ngano versus Jones. Ngano is like, even though he's not, he's pretty popular actually. People like any videos, they're always hitting a million views on YouTube. He's, people think he's like pretty, uh, uh, like, you know, big heavyweights are powerful, always popular, like Tyson, blah, blah, blah. So he has that kind of Tyson aura. Like you, he's, he can just knock you out. So everybody wants to see it. And John Jones is an enigma, right? Like he's the greatest of all time. He's kind of the boogeyman. Like he has all the, all the, all the accolades and all the controversies, which still brings attention, right? A lot of people hate John Jones. And what do they want to see him against? In Ganu. Like, that's the biggest dude, yes. So UFC um, wants – he basically tells the UFC, he gets on a phone call and tells them, if you offer me 8 to $10 million, you're severely underpaying me. And that and erupted a firestorm online saying he's ungrateful, not knowing, blah, blah, blah. Just you shouldn't have signed. The classic one is, is the MMA dweeb that says, you, should have, you shouldn't have signed the contract. You shouldn't have signed the contract. Okay, it's a two-way street. If the UFC can renegotiate you anytime they want, then you should be able to renegotiate when you want, right? They don't uphold terms because they can cut you without a buyout when they want. So you can uphold terms when you want too. It's not like soccer where – you sign a seven-year contract. If you destroy that, people like – or even basketball, Gilbert Arenas, you cut his contract, he's going to get paid for a long time. UFC has flimsy contracts because these guys aren't full-time employees. They're independent contractors, so they get to snake around these deals. Um, the UFC was very happy that they had to cut a bunch of people this year. They cut tons of fighters, and a bunch of those really good fighters like Yoel Romero, the Cuban, the Cuban missile, went um, over to Bellator. So – which, and, which I'm happy for, but John Jones, you know, I think he deserves the pay. I think he deserves the payout. I mean, you defend 15 straight titles. You've been the youngest champion in history. You came back and you haven't really, I mean, you had that weird DUI incident, but you haven't been in trouble in a few years. You're just doing your thing and you, why not? I mean, it's a win-win for the UFC, right? If he wins, it just keeps him, the star bigger and you get the more accolades. If he loses, you get what a lot of people want. It makes Ngannou's star bigger, and Ngannou only has here to grow. Ngannou's starting at this plateau and goes. John Jones is already at that plateau, so it's a kind of a win-win. And it's not even about the UFC taking a risk. It's them just about them being kind of uh, cheap about it. But go ahead. You know what UFC really wants, dog? <sighs> go ahead. UFC and what would really be beneficial to like UFC and Dana White mm. if there was a white dude to fight John Jones. Yeah, like Stipe. Like you need a white dude that like could potentially beat him. Like that's the thing that's gonna make like because just like with like Floyd Mayweather, like his fights against like Canelo or against like like the, whenever you have like a thing where it can be like whoever against this black guy. <laughs> That's going to yeah. be the thing that sells it out. I mean, I do – obviously, Ngannou versus Jones is going to be a big fight. But if you can have – if you can juxtapose – like, who, who's, the, who's the MAGA dude? Oh, Kobe Covington. Yeah. Like, I don't know if he was a heavyweight or what, but, like, mm -mm -mm. he was a little guy? He's a 170, yeah. Okay. But if you could have had him – Yeah. Like, that would be – Him and John Jones used to be roommates. That's funny. <laughs> that would have been the biggest thing ever. Yeah. I agree. Because it's polarizing. It is. It, it is something. If, if it was, even if it was like, honestly, if it was like um, some of those other previous, like even if it was like Cain Velasquez, something like that, it still would have been big too. Like Cain Velasquez one of the biggest of all time. So that would have been pretty crazy too. But is he not black? No, he's Mexican. Yeah, that, 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 there you go. I mean, that's bigger in boxing to have like Mexican versus black. That's I mean, bigger Cain in boxing. Cain Velasquez was big in UFC too. He was big time. 
But like in, um, in, in boxing, there's a big like like Hispanic versus yeah. black like thing like that yeah. that exists in boxing for a long time. Of course, because they always talk about like oh Mexican fighters, blah blah blah, and yeah, all that and stuff. Yeah. Th- there there was a what's his name um the dude from Panama and stuff, um and uh what's his name Oscar, Oscar De La Hoya. Yeah, yeah. Um, He's gonna fight again. Oh my god! But uh yeah, I, if they can like that's what they need to do. Like you need to find you need to like get you a white guy that can like kind of get a couple wins under his belt, start coming for John Jones. That's, that's the thing that could get John Jones eight to 10 million. No, he, he wants more. Oh, well, like, I mean, I, I don't think he's going to get that. Me either. <laughs> like, I don't think it's happen, it's really annoying because the problem with the UFC is never going to have true fighter success is that they all step on each other's toes. So they don't unionize. So the big example, which, I mean, he's a funny guy. Great. Like Derek, Derek Lewis, um, he's been winning again. The guy that did my, my balls are hot, whatever interview. He's very popular on social media. He's a knockout dude. He's a fat guy. He's funny. Um, he's been winning a lot. And then last time him and Gano fought, it was boring. But they were both kind of weird periods. So they want to rematch and like whatever. Dana White, who, of course, instead of being a promoter, he's the master manipulator. He's not the fighter's promoter. He's a master manipulator. He goes, well, you know, if that's something that we can't get with John Jones, I know Derek Lewis would take the fight. I'm like, dude, we don't want to watch Derek Lewis fight. Everybody wants to watch a John Jones fight. UFC always puts out that they make the fights happen, right? Like, unlike boxing, we wait seven years for, for Floyd and Pacquiao, then it's boring. UFC's like, we'll get it done. Yeah, because they just – undercut the mess out of people and like make it or like just completely like uh, exonerate them from fighting other ways and they just get stuck no matter what and if they turn down three fights then they get cut so it's like yeah they get to, they get like these monster things against them so he tweets out eight eight to ten eight million i'll take the fight she so it's like <laughs> dude we're not gonna <laughs> we're just not gonna get anywhere because there's too much leverage on the UFC fighter side. The UFC fighters don't have leverage. They have no representation. They, um, they don't work together through the big court case they were having. They were having a massive court case with the Supreme Court about the Ali Act. And a lot of the fighters did not speak up on it. They did not speak on it. Only some Bellator fighters were involved. Um, outside retired fighters were, very fight, were fighting for it big time. But no active fighters uh, spoke on it. They released all kinds of receipts and transcripts about UFC um, paying people 10% of their marginal value, um, cutting people, uh, threatening them, all kinds of things, all kinds of receipts, voice recordings, nothing, nothing out of it. And uh, because you're dealing with a billion dollar company, right? And you need, you need the masses to come together to surpass a big monster company like that, especially a monster like Dana White. So I, it, I don't think it's going to work. I mean, I will say this. John Jones does seem to have some kind of weird pull with the UFC. Um, he's been able to somehow be still in the team, elite, uh, being part of the UFC after all the crazy stuff. Um, he has had issues in the past, and they came together and negotiated. So he has some kind of pull. And he's actually not even – the crazy thing about him is he never, he never negotiates with Dana White. He actually only negotiates with the VP of the company, which is a guy named Hunter Campbell, who – was at all his trials, and he has his cell phone number. So they talked to each other. So even Dana White in a press conference says, I mean, that's something he can just talk to Hunter Campbell about. Like, So you could tell that him and Dana White just don't work together anymore. Dana White's over, and he's over it. So hope, hopefully something comes to fruition. And I think that the important step is like him saying that if it was Conor McGregor, everybody's understanding that why he hasn't fought in three years because he wants more money or pay me, pay me. And even before Conor McGregor was trying to get a portion of UFC, he was trying to buy stock in the UFC and they weren't, and they weren't allowing it. They didn't want him to have too much power because he was soaring to the heavens. Um, but John Jones, like, it's funny that I want more money. It's a big issue. And that guy's never even defended a title in his life. I've defended 15 of them, but you know, it is what it is, uh, and people can't even say he's not big time because he's at all the pay per views he's been in have also been pretty big too. So, although he hasn't done like a, a million pay per view sales really, but he, across them they're always above seven hundred. And if you've done fifteen above seven hundred, that's a consistent market value that's pretty high, especially in today's pay per view. Pay per views eighty dollars a pop now. That needs to be fifty. If you're selling seven fifty k at eighty dollars each, that's really good. So. Um, he has value. We'll see what happens. I hope the fight happens. 
And yeah, that's kind of the John June synopsis, I guess, of what's going on. Well, you were hating on his Twitter. You was going off. I mean, what, what happened? I just, to I don't. This is the thing, though. This is the thing. I'm, I'm, and I'm willing to like defend it because it's like, I understand what he's trying to say, I guess. But I just hate how he communicates to people. I think I hate how he's taking it. Like, when you tweet like this, you can't tell people. I want eight to 10, blah, 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 blah. It comes off like you're not understanding the climate of the world. You're not understanding what's going on. You need to speak in numbers. You need to speak in a way people understand to get on your side. You need to talk about how other examples you have of people getting paid more than you and why you feel like you're owed so we can go, you know what? Yeah, I mean, he does deserve more than that, dude. That's ridiculous. We don't get to do that. You're just giving flat fees because the UFC doesn't do disclose payouts. They disclose the 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 media one but they have a lot of under payouts that we don't hear about they pay people on the side differently all this stuff that's not disclosed so we don't know about that so when you just come out saying oh eight to ten million is too low when every time we look at a fight it says the max payers the max guys getting 500k show and win we're just like what the you're gonna get like whoa like okay so and there's and you got a, and you got probably one of the dumbest communities ever following you so you got to approach it correctly. I think he's too much of a professional. He's been here too long, and he has too much of an expensive PR team around him to tweet like he's a nine-year-old. That's what's annoying. Like, you're still tweeting like a nine-year-old. You're a professional, right? You're, you want to be treated like a professional? Then you can't act like this. It's like the whole behavior, like, on, on Twitter. I just think it's, it's really weak. And then they're, like, using his tweets as screenshots on, like, articles. I'm like, God, like, it just looks so dumb. You got, like, a lion picture. It just looks dumb, dude. Like, it's so unprofessional. Like, someone like Canelo, like, he has a legit a, a press release based upon what's going on. Like, he has a team that releases something with a signature, so it's official wording. Like, I don't like it. And he has some stances, I think, that are really disgusting um, on, upon, like, the world. I think that – he hates Lil Nas X and thinks it's disgusting what he did. Um, he said he's going to burn all his Nike shoes or whatever. And then he said, oh, never mind. Good job. They're, they're, they're suing him. Um, he was at the BLM protests uh, trying to fight BLM protesters that were um, uh, spray painting stuff. So he's just corny. He, he's pro-gun super, and he has a big canine. I know what team you're on, big dog. And I'm still willing to come on here and defend what you're owed. But as terms of what he stands for and a lot of stuff, I'm completely over. Like, no. I mean, damn, dog. Uh, 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 you, wait, what was the first one? I went on this show, and I still to this day defend that he beat Dominic Reyes. And there's people that still talk about him saying that he lost that last fight. I watched it. It's like the Canelo Floyd thing. No, dude. He, he wasn't hitting him for real. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not how I went down. John Jones didn't come out of there battered and destroyed. So that's not what went down. I'm sorry. Um, and I think he won the last fight. I watched it three times before I did that recap on We Made It podcast. And so, yeah, like I'll defend him even if I, he stands against a lot of things I believe in and I hate. I mean, uh, he he's weird. I mean, I, I don't know much about him as a person. He seems kind of weird and he seems like he's the he most un-New York guy I've ever met in my life. Well, they're from like upstate somewhere. They're not from like New York. Rochester. State. Yeah, yeah. They're not from the city. They're from somewhere up there where there's like. He's a, always been like weird too. Like they've done a bunch of events in New York. And he always goes like, yeah, it'd be dope to fight here. But, you know, the taxes and everything. I'm like, no. All right. Sure, man. Yeah, no. <laughs> you he, literally live in Albuquerque, my guy. But okay. Yeah, no. He's not from New York City by any means. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy that he like comments on all those things and like he's like going out trying to fight protesters. Like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, like he had like legit video of him like snatching spray cans. I'm like, dog, it's really funny that like you're that MMA dude. Like, run up on the wrong person, chief. Run up on the wrong person. You may you may be able to fight and throw hands and wrestle. Run up on the wrong person doing that, especially at a time when it was it was it was like iffy times right there. And you're this big black dude going against other people. That's like you're you're funny because like people saw that and there's a reason why there's a part of the community that doesn't really rock with you okay because you're this guy you're he's like the dude that rolls with the other team uh that surrounds him and they don't really associate with what was going on with the world what the george floyd stuff he never commented on it, but i think i know where he stood on it um so it, it's it's it sucks um i thought that sometimes he had some good things he said um he, he speaks about okay this is my annoying my last point John Jones, what I've seen as an example is that 
race becomes an issue for him when it's an inconvenience of what's going on with him, right? For himself, for himself. When other people of the same background are going through struggles, and that includes Lil Nas X, because I think for a lot of stuff, that's the, 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 the clapback that he gets to, other artists have done in the past too. There's been plenty of, of, of music when Cannibal Corpse, these other kind of bands that have done this kind of promotion, and they don't get the same backlash. They think, oh, it's just the genre. But this is a black homosexual rapper. It's going to be easy to pile on him online. So regardless of the satanic, fine, whatever. But it's easy to pile on that stuff. John Jones, and he, he, he jumps on BLM. Like, it's an inconvenience because you're, to you because when you're dealing with it. But when you're disassociated living out in the boony desert, and you, you know the people that live with you in Albuquerque, okay, um, that's fine. And his house and who he's married to, all that. It's different than this whole entire community. So you don't feel what the people feel because you're not a part of it. But when you're suffering from what they're suffering from, then it becomes an issue. So don't let race become a convenience for you for negotiation. If this is an issue you're having, don't just tweet, oh, yeah, it feels Conor McGregor. After this, if you get paid, take steps towards changing that for the future, right? Because if you have an issue with it, then you should have an issue if it happens to the next guy. You should have an issue if it happens to Izzy. If it happens, even if you hate Izzy, I know him and Izzy hate each other. If it happens to, to, to Nganu, if it happens to other people, you should be like, you know what? I know what you've been through. Here's what I did. Here's what you can do to make blah, blah, blah. Here's a negotiation. It should be steps. He should make an initiative or something like that. to be like, oh, look, Here's my, what my lawyer sent me for negotiation, uh, negotiations for these contracts. Any of these fighters can have access to it, especially the, uh, the other, I think, four or five black champions now. You've If they want to see what the negotiated higher prices, here what it is. That's what it's about. you got to move steps towards helping each other rather than using it as a crutch or a convenience for you to, to negotiate your side. Well, good try. Good try trying to uh, keep on talking like I forgot about the whole Lil Nas X rant. <laughs> but... Uh... <laughs> that was a good try there. I do remember that. I did just look up his wife though. Um you I mean not his wife. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. His his fiance of nine years. Okay, go. Well, you're sounding racist. Um you know, is like people there's a lot of people that will play that card, like play that race card when it's convenient. And when like when you were like telling me the stuff that he was tweeting, I'm like, he sounds like Kanye, because Kanye does the same thing. It's like Oh, the race stuff is like when it's now a, it's an issue. When it's happened to me, like yeah, it's racism, yo. But but like when it's going on in the world, it's like that's not even important. Um, it, it, it I, was always I, hypocritical. I, I doubt he'll change, but um, never. He, you know he, he'll um, he but but he will get his wake up call. He will, and he's gotten a few times and hasn't heed the warnings of it. He hasn't heed the warnings from the wake up call. There's been a few that rocked him. Um, but he's been given the third, third chance, fourth chance. So you don't learn from third and fourth chances, do you? Unfortunately, some people just don't learn that way. They learn where at the, they, they, when everything's taken, unfortunately, they, get, they learn. He, um, he, it's funny that he's the kind of person that would criticize behavior of people, of citizens uh, during BLM. When, what's his behavior been in certain in situations? What's your behavior been like? Have you, acted, have you always acted rationally? Are you a rational person? It's funny that you want to snatch spray cans off kids in the street in Albuquerque because they're upset what's going on. But what was you snatching? Okay, yeah, good. I've always thought that John Bone Jones got something in common with Lil Nas X. I mean, that's literally the most fact thing ever. Um, and I think that, that's what, I think that's what drives some of his anger. I've always thought that. I'm like, mm. yeah, he's a little, and he gets a little over aggressive about this stuff. I'm like, people they get too mad about. It. Oh no! When you get too mad about it, I'm like, hmm. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> <laughs> you anyway, know, hey, <laughs> um, uh, do you know like when? Well, obviously, Darren Till and Marco Verratti got canceled. So when is yes. like the next, when so? Is, when is the next big fight? The rep- well, the bit next. There's a there's been a couple announcements. I mean, obviously, a lot of people know De- Conor McGregor is going to be fighting in July. Oh really? And yes, and also uh, the the first event in history. So. I don't know if you remember the first guy to whoop Conor McGregor's ass, Nate Diaz. Hmm. He's going to fight against uh, Leon Edwards, the most annoying British dude of all time, um, uh, who just recently uh, was actually had the worst luck. He um, had two of his fights canceled due to COVID. He was in England, so he wasn't allowed to leave. Then he was going to fight another fighter who was like this monster come up dude. And he was ranked number one. And the UFC forced him 
to fight a guy who was unranked. <laughs> he was a number one contender, and they were making him fight a guy named Co- Cosmot, uh, <laughs> who was unranked. And that guy got COVID out in uh, uh, in Dagestan, and his COVID ban was so bad that he legit tweeted a picture of him coughing blood and tweeted out, I can't do this anymore. I, I don't even know if I want to live anymore, let alone fight or something like that. Like, he oh literally was saying that he doesn't want to fight anymore. He can't even imagine fighting. I retire. Everybody came out and the, those representatives, no, no, he's fine. He's just, you know, fighters are emotional. I'm like, dog, like. Jesus Christ, the slave life is real. Um, so, th- <laughs> like, this man can't even have a freedom whether he wants to punch people or not anymore. So, allegedly, he said he's going to work and come back. He had a moment. I get it. I guess it happens. Um, but, so, Le- uh, Leon Edwards is waiting forever to fight. Got a fight recently. Finally got to fight somebody. Fought a dude that was ranked number 15 or 14, a bottom-tier guy. Because no one on top, like, Kobe Covington didn't want to fight him. And Leon Edwards is really good. He's supposed to fight. Usman, that's the guy who needs a fight. He goes into the fight, and I pokes this guy so bad that the eye was bleeding, and they made it a DQ, and they can't call the fight off. So the guy waited a year through the entire COVID to fight, and then the first second round, he's destroying the dude. He eye pokes him into oblivion. So he's back waiting for fight again. And the UFC, we said, we got you, fam. They gave him Nate Diaz as the co-main event for the UFC Houston card. The UFC Jacksonville card that's coming up is actually going to be the first full event in uh, United States. Um, it's a, I think it's scheduled right before the Rangers game. That's supposed to be the first one, the baseball game. Um, but that's like what they're talking about. So it's going to be a full capacity fight in, in Jacksonville, Florida. So COVID bomb, here we go. Uh, they should call UFC 262, 262 COVID. Um, so, yeah, it's going to go down. He's going to – Nate Diaz is coming back to fight. Um, I think he's going to get his ass beat, to be honest with you. Um, He's getting old, and he's from Stockton. And this, the the English on this tweet is wild. This guy's from Stockton. Let me read this tweet to you. Ready? This Caesar is going in. This is too funny right now. You're loving this. Oh, listen. <laughs> check me out May 15th. Uh, check me out May 15th. I'll be headlining UFC 262 in Houston, Texas. No periods. I'll also have the new UFC light heavyweight title card. I need people to know these guys. They've been working hard, very hard. I can't wait to see who gets my old crown. See you guys there. You guys one word together with just a you. So wild tweet, but I guess that's a promo. Um, uh, that's why they can't be on Twitter for real. So anyways, uh, yeah, that's the fight that's coming up. Mar- Marvin Ferrari Verratti, his replacement fighter is someone that, bam, I know what if you watch the fight would hate him. Kevin Holland is taking his place, a.k.a. Kevin Big Mouth Holland. The last fight Kevin Holland had – the UFC Apex has no fans, and he just talked the whole time, screaming out loud, going, come on, man, come on, hit, hit my hand, hit my hand, dog, come on, hit it, come on, man, oh, that's it, oh, like, just five, uh, 45 minutes of this, it was just the worst thing ever, and the worst part is that he was just getting his ass beat the whole time, so it's like, what are we even doing here, like, at least talk and be winning, um, so yeah, he was fighting and talking the whole time. He lost the fight. He was even talking to Khabib during ha- during the breaks. Like, what do I do with my hips? What do I do with them? Yeah, it was just it was bad. Uh, these have been waiting so long to talk about this. I what's the big fight? This dude talking about some random. So then he's gonna fight Marvin Ferrari. <laughs> he's gonna fight Ferrari Variety in the place of Till, as Bam c- called it first. Wonder That's Boy. What, his name's not Wonder Boy. Wonder Boy Till and uh, Wonder Boy's not Scouse, so no. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the big event. Um, the guy who I hate the most in the UFC, other than Colby Covington, Jorge Masvidal is going to fight too. And yeah, against oh, Carl Usman. He's still around? Jeez. Yeah, he's he's uh, yeah, he, the, cult, the Trump lover. Well, man, that was a lot, man. All right, episode one. <laughs> episode one, uh, 96, uh, We Made It podcast. Make sure you follow your boy and check out my Twitch tonight. Oh. We have a big stream tonight. Okay, uh, oh, uh, us. Uh, relax, relax. Well, nobody's going to hear this before the stream anyway, but y'all make sure you go follow We Made It Seas on Twitch. Your boy right here, me, me, I'm the best friend that anybody's ever had. And this is no cap in my rap. I be going on Twitter, searching. You know what? I should just put it on the goddamn, uh, I should put it on. You do go hard. 
He do hard. I, I should put it on the. Actually, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, black Twitch streamer finding anybody talking about looking for a streamer? Plug the homie sees. We made it Twitch slash. Uh, we made. Oh uh, wait, Twitch TV slash. We made it sees. He's on there now. Now, me. It's hard for me to digest it. You know, what I mean, it's hard for me to watch stream sees. It's not easy for me to. It's not easy for me to watch <laughs> stream sees. Other people, I'm sure, love it. You know, he's very animated. You know, he's he, you know he's got a lot of energy. You know what I'm saying? He's laughing a lot about stuff. You know, stuff and he's. Yeah. You know, he's I'm very doing, tired after. <laughs> he's doing the whole thing. I'm very real during the entire broadcast. <laughs> me, I'm like, whew, All right, yo, that, that's enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but when you stream, no. But but don't try don't try to do a snitch. But it's a great time. Um, he be watching the fight videos, playing games. World uh, star. Um, uh, getting too angry during the games. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, and and, and like you can do like BAM strategy. If you just don't like when I'm talking, just start talking to everybody else in the chat. Have conversations in there. Well, also, Caesar's not the greatest chat reader also, which is also first. Just know. Playing a first-person shooter and expecting me to read chat is bonkers. That's one of the most hardest things ever. Okay. Uh, regardless of what I, whatever he's playing. I mean, I'm popping. What do you expect? Caesar's not the best chat reader, so that's why it's also frustrating because I'd be hella funny in there. we having stuff to say, and he just ignore it. Or he just, like, start to read it and be squinting hella hard and just give up, and I'm just like, I can't. Uh, I wish <laughs> I could make the text bigger. <laughs> I wish when I get my third monitor, I'm just going to make one monitor just chat. That's what it's going to be. It's just going to all have the chat and, and like 72 aerial for me. Bold too. Bold. Pause. And also, damn, Caesar sub, them subs coming in. Okay. Third monitor. Okay. And subs are caking. I mean, it's, it's been the next couple months have been nice. I'm not going to lie to you, boy. It's just, we're breaking records right here. We're going to start. We're paying taxes now. That's what I'm saying. Caking up, we who's we? Cause uh, we. Yeah. <laughs> we made it seasons. No, I'm just joking. Anyway, uh, let's talk about a little bit of soccer stuff before we get out of here. Um, apparently, oh, yeah, soccer. Apparently, the U.S. men's national team under 23s were trying to qualify for the Olympics that will be held this year in Japan. Oh, also, Caesar, I just got a text from uh, some club in Anaheim saying that they're opening this Friday. And there's going to be like limited capacity. <laughs> they like sent, sent me a text message. I'm like, what is this? I've seen videos of people going to club in Santa Ana already. There's already, there's already, there's already fight, California Fight Club videos coming that back out. So we're back, baby. We're back it, in full force, I guess. They said no cover, no, no cover. I might just pull up. <laughs> I might pull up. Um, um, yeah, so the U.S. Men's National Team was trying to qualify for the Olympics, um, and they ended up crashing out, losing 2-1 to Honduras on some, like, weird play by the goalie. He was trying to, like, pass it out the back, and it, like, hit the dude's, the Honduras guy's foot or something like that. Um, Jason Christ, who I remember him from, I feel like he coached in MLS for a while. Christ? Crease or Christ or something like that. I don't remember him. I, I feel like he coached MLS for a little bit. Um, yeah, this is the second uh, major tournament that the USA is missing out on, which which they have to qualify for. They didn't qualify for the World Cup, and now they're not qualifying for the Olympics. Um, no. It's, it's, it's really like – I mean, I don't even pay attention to the U.S. men's national team at all anymore, but when I heard that, I'm like, yo, dog. And, and I was watching them um, highly questionable, and they were talking about it. And they were just like, dude, what's up with this? Like, we, we, you keep on telling us every year that, oh, the, these young guys, man, like these young guys, they're going to be the next ones. And, and it like never happens. And, and that's facts. I mean, I, I remember after they lost, I wanted to go look up the roster. I was like, who, who are these people? Like, what, what is this? And not in any offense, like, just know me and them are active watchers of the sport. Like, we watch this sport and we are definite surveyors of talent if there's one thing that i think especially me like what i like seeing i love recognizing and spotting some talent on the field and it, it you're you'll be hard pressed when i've seen that with an american player like and i've we've said it before when an american player is talented we've done episodes where we defend american players we talk about american players we've gone back on what we originally thought about players to now and i've seen these like the names on these lists i'm like uh, uh 
are you like there's two things going on here one you're just grabbing people because they have they are playing for like they've got a, a one cap for these teams in england i'm like that's great like is that why you think he's good you know the guy that they were all talking about what's that guy that played for um uh played for Wolver wolves right they have some american american commit dude some defender I Bam! I watched him play one time. Okay, this dude is not good. Okay, he's not good, and everybody's like, "Oh, we got this guy uh, committed to USA." I'm like, "He's not good." Like, I don't care if he committed to America just because he's from England. He's not good though. Like, I know when a young defender is good, I, c- I can see good hit movement. I can see good body. I can see good uh, uh, speed. He has nothing. I didn't go away from that game going, "Oh, he has some talent." He just was. He was a body running around. And it's annoying. It's just frustrating because those coaches over there know when they can just put a person to hold a position down, or they know when they're putting a person, they're putting somebody they know has talent. There's a difference. There's someone you're willing to put out there because they just won't make a ton of mistakes and they'll be okay, or they just need to because you're you're strong. Your your lineup is rough because of COVID, or they're putting someone because this guy is just too good not to play. I haven't seen. It's been very few examples of American players are just too good not to play in in Europe. It's very few examples. Right. And some of these other guys are just recent commits. So it's not like they've come up to the American Academy and blah, blah, blah. So the number one, the U.S. men's national, the number one thing the USSF Mafia does is they don't work towards building youth talent. They campaign about youth talent. They're good campaigners. They run a good campaign, right? Nike jerseys, cool ads, and this guy, big announcement, a guy, Bur- uh, Brazilian, who was in, Bur- in America for three weeks, is now committed to playing for the U.S. men's national team, and he's out of, out of Brazil, Internacional Brasil. Like, uh, he plays for international. He plays for Brazil. Great, man. Bam, I watched Johnny Cardozo play for Internacional. I watched the game because I have it on Sling TV. That's what I did. I was like, wait, what is the number again? That's what I was doing over and over. Like, he's just dead regular, fine. He could be a super talent, just regular. But they keep acting like things are getting better, and they keep acting like it. And that's what's unfair because you're telling people that things are getting better when it's not, when it should be. Like, you you hired the – the what was it, the, the coach of the Columbus crew? Isn't that the current coach of the U.S. national team, the actual yeah, team? And then we were like, why are you getting the Burt Halter or whatever? Like, Why? <laughs> They should have been getting someone popping like Pellegrino, some Pellegrino. I don't know. Get some uh, popping. You got money like that, right? So they ain't doing nothing. They're just collecting checks off the government. They're not really doing nothing special. Well, let me just say that the episode being seventeen minutes is is this your fault? This time it's my fault. But last <laughs> time you finessed me. Last time it was an hour and ten minutes when you said it's gonna be the shortest of all time. This time it's my fault because you had me talking about UFC the first time in six months. So that's your fault. <laughs> I went the whole COVID without UFC, so it's your fault. Well, I was like, yo, I was going off about this too, but it's okay. I mean, it's it's like at this point for me, I just don't even pay attention to it. I wouldn't even have known. I just happened to come across when I was like looking up what's going on in soccer. I was like, wait, what? So, like they didn't qualify? Like what in the world? Yeah, how you not qualify? I think I'm, Japan qualified and they did. Uh, literally, you're playing like Honduras and Costa Rica and stuff. Um, like bam. So now, so, so now, now Honduras and Mexico are the teams going from Concacaf to the Olympics. Yeah. Honduras. <laughs> These are Honduras the biggest. They have a bigger budget than all those countries combined. Oh, like triple, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, I'm over here looking at the U21 team for France, and it's got like. Dudes that start like he's got like Ikone and Gwenduzi and Guiri who starts for uh Nice and Edouard who started for um Celtic for a long time. Oh, ballers, they're bringing, they're bringing in Kamavinga off the bench. They got that dude, uh, Kuande who plays for Sevilla, like their best center back. <laughs> like Colin Dagba, who's like starting for PSG sometimes. Like it, it's really a joke, and like I don't know why anybody has any expectations for US men's national team. But I will say this. I wonder how much money Jason Christ make coaching this damn U23 team. Mm. I wonder how much money he makes. I wonder. Because I remember when Jill Ellis was making, I, I feel like I remember there was a point where she was making less than the U23 coach at, at one time. I feel like we reported on that. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to try to skim through this article really fast because I feel like it was in here. Um. Oh my God, Brazil's team is insane. 
Um, oh my okay. God. Okay, I can't find it, but I just wonder how much money um, somebody like, oh no, it was Tab Ramos. Like he was coaching the U21, he was coaching the U20 and he was making like way more than Jill Ellis at the time. Um, she got a boost in salary from uh, winning the World Cup, but before that she was making way less. Um, yeah. So obviously, um, I'm not gonna let you say the Brazilian U20. Can I just name some of them, please? No, no. Yeah, go ahead. Never mind. You, name, name three of them. Name three of them. Vinicius Jr., Gabriel Martinelli, and uh, who can I pick out of this lineup? Uh, Lucas Paqueta. Like these oh. dudes, like start from Milan, Bayern Leverkusen, Real Madrid. Like who, who starts? Who starts from Milan? Lucas, I mean, I'm sorry, Leon, Leon, not Milan, Leon. No, don't play, that. don't play. He over there putting on with Leon. He over there putting on doing dances and everything. His first goal with Leon, he was like already doing dances, dog. <laughs> the guy who actually like um the ask, have you seen a Brazilian for Aston Villa the dude with the 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 colored uh, braids? Uh, Douglas he's a, or something. He's in the midfield, he's like a CDM. What's his name? Douglas. Douglas. Oh yeah, he's good. He's good. He's really good. He's on a team too. My like, dog, they, that that's someone who's on a team and they're getting like burned, like they're playing, like they're active. You got guys that are just like coming on in these minutes. I'm like the only guy that I really saw that's young is like that uh, guy who plays for uh, Valencia, but he plays for the actual national team. He doesn't even play for the Olympic youth team. He plays for the actual team. Well, some of the some of the players that would have that, that maybe would have played in these qualifiers, they couldn't come for these games because of COVID. Mm -hmm. But yeah. either but either Rodrigo way, couldn't go either. Rodrigo for for Real Madrid couldn't go. Like, but there's there's no there's no there's no excuse. Like like there's no excuse yeah. for the U.S. men's national team to be to not qualify playing against uh, Honduras. Japan. Yeah. No, like Honduras lineup. Come on, dog. Like I'm not even trying to be mean. Like come on, like. You're over here always talking about these guys getting these call-ups and starts or whatever for these teams, but Honduras come in and still beat you. And it, and and it, for the American media, the the regular casual fan watcher that remembers y'all losing to to Haiti, I believe. No, 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 to uh, Trinidad, Trinidad, Trinidad. Trinidad. They feel like it's the same thing again. They're like, oh, here you go again. They telling us everything's popping. They got new jerseys, new kids. They're young and fresh, and it's a whole different team. They got rid of yelling for no reason, and boom! Like now you lost again to somebody, and you lost. Oh, you couldn't make Olympic qualifiers. Like, no one even watches Olympic soccer. I do because I'm a I'm a freak about it. But people don't even watch Olympic. They they hate it. It's too long. I rather a lot of people rather watch track or ping pong. <laughs> Caesar, I I'm gonna tell you the only way the U.S. men's national team, one of these youth teams, are gonna get good, is if they bring in you and I as the head coaches. Keep a couple of the fitness guys. We'll keep a few of them, but you know what? The first thing we're gonna do, practicing on the full damn field. field. And we're gonna be running on that joint too. We're gonna bring the U16s. We're gonna play them against y'all U20s. All the time. You better you better hope that none of them are better than you. <laughs> you better gonna do, what was that? I forgot what that player was that they like just sent to the youth team or Chelsea. To, you better not hold one of them young dudes is good. You're gonna be switching spots, buddy. You're gonna be playing down there with the middle schoolers until you get better. <laughs> exactly. Don't play. Um I'm dead. But anyway, um US Miss National Team is trash. And um what, what is it? Oh, oh, so there, there's Champions League coming up next week. There is. Finally. Um, Lewandowski got hurt. And oh, I wonder what the score is in that Poland match right oh, now. Random thing. I did not know Grabby Martel is that young. Oh, my God. Young dude. They, they, He's they, the they, youngest dude on the whole team. <laughs> um, 19. Oh, my God. Well, they're also – you know what? I feel like um, – He's younger than Vinicius Jr. He's born in 2001. Jesus Christ. You know, honestly, they're they're talking about um, his situation with uh, Arsenal. I, I feel like Arteta is like got some is like a weird power trip kind of guy because yeah. Martinelli is really good, and I don't understand no, why he he's a baller. Play. Yeah, I don't understand why he doesn't play. Um, also, North Macedonia beat Germany today, but um, I, I blame I blame some of the activist players. Really. Mm. <laughs> um, so Lewandowski got hurt. He's going to be out for four months. He's going to miss probably both legs of the PSG match. Um, but next week we got coming up Real Madrid versus Liverpool, City versus BVB, Bayern versus PSG, Porto versus Chelsea. Um, 
I mean, for sure you're looking for do you, do, Real Madrid versus uh, Liverpool. Like, there's no real upset in that. Um, City versus BVB. Could you see there being a um, an upset? BVB beating City. Could you see it? I can see it. Um, the only reason you can see it too is because, I'm not saying that I necessarily pick BVB. I'm not saying that, but when you just have like talent like BVB has, anything could happen, dude. You know how it is, Bam. Any of these teams, any sport, car, any sport you play, you have guys like Holland. And sometimes I, I went back and watched that video game of him, his uh, his runs or whatever. I'm like, God dang, you're making me uncomfortable. Dude. You're way too big and fast. <laughs> um, him and and and, and Jadon Sancho. Uh, well, uh, talk, you never talk know. A, talk a bit about uh, Real Madrid Liverpool while I uh, go take a smoke break really fast. Okay. Uh, um, new new ep- new podcast. So yeah, then Liverpool Real Madrid. Um, literally, I. I'm going to be very honest with you guys. There's – I know Liverpool is not, like, top of the league right now, but I'm very scared. The one thing that Real Madrid gets destroyed in uh, is these counterattack teams. When 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 they're pressuring – if they pressure Real Madrid, if they do, like, a full-court press on uh, Real Madrid – and they make the defenders make a bunch of decisions, we'll go out and go, granted, Sergio Ramos is back, so it's better – it just gets scary back there sometimes. It gets scary. Um, there's too much talent on that Liverpool team, and they may not be balling out all the way in Premier League, but they know how to put in work on, on Champions League. So we'll see what happens. Um, I'm as a as a Real Madrid fan, of course, I'm gonna like be like think that Real Madrid is to pull it off, and I can see how Real Madrid can. I got no ways they can, but Liverpool, that team is. It's a lot of uh, wing talent that's coming at you, and someone like Roberto Firmino, Roberto Firmino can really just break it down and, and completely change the game for you. You're muted. Um, I can hear you still. Um, yeah, I think that Liverpool is um, – I mean, it's, it's a good team no matter what, like however they're doing in uh, mm-hmm. EPL. Um, w- I remember when – when uh, Real Madrid was playing Shakhtar in the group stage and um, Real Madrid was just chasing the entire match a lot of times. And I don't know if Liverpool can really do that. Obviously Liverpool can counter very well and press and counter. Um, I don't know what it was about Shakhtar that just had Real Madrid chasing the entire time. Um, But I mean, either way, like regardless, like even if Liverpool was like 15th in EPL, like it's still a good team. And all the big teams have been inconsistent, including Real Madrid. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if I had to say who has the better team, talent-wise, I would say from top to bottom, I might say Real Madrid just because I feel like their back line is a lot better. Um, what's his name? Uh, with, with Virgil van Dijk is out. Um, I mean, I think a healthy Real Madrid, I guess I'll agree with you, I guess. I feel like just, just because the back line is so much better. Um, I, I feel like up top overall, I think Liverpool is a better team up top. I, I agree. I agree with that. But, like. But Real Madrid does have better midfielders, too. I, I feel like most of the game is played, like, in the those, like, four and three. In the, from the back to the three midfielders. Like, I feel like the most, since most of the game is going to be played really in that area like I feel like Real Madrid is has more talent especially with Virgil van Dijk being out but I mean but it's it's so close it doesn't even matter like no either way like either way I can see it going to penalties in the second in the second leg Uh, the only the only reason I would think Liverpool can like win is because Real Madrid's Achilles heel has always been like speed uh, speed wingers that's kind of their Achilles heel you know, from the past of Gelson Martins and these kind of players that really can, when they take advantage of that full press that they put on Real Madrid and Real Madrid occasionally a, a backline defender will make a mistake a little bit, then it's like they end up chasing sometimes. And when they get chasing, it's too much speed to chase. And not only on this front line, that I mean, not only are the, the starters fast, but even on some of those guys come off the bench, that will have a crazy fast. Jota is like a blurrer out there. That dude is bonkers fast. Camacho's fast. They have players that come off that bench and that have a lot of speed. And that's dangerous in the later stages of the game. So 
we'll see how it goes. I think it's going to be very key on player management, how player fitness is. That's going to be really important too. I always know that Zidane is always going to try to quit the best lineup he has. And I think, I think it'll be, I think it'll be close and I don't think it'll be like some fun action game. I think it'd be pretty boring to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I, think, mean, it'll be, I think it'll be a PK game kind of thing. It won't be like, <laughs> Oh, like barn burner five, six aggregate. No, it's going to be like real chess going on here. Yeah, I mean, and I feel like Real Madrid has a lot of speed too. You got Valverde. Oh yeah, Mindy, like you got you got some speed. They, Nacho, they, you feel me? Um, they they match up well, so we'll see. Um, I want to see Nacho run down like uh, Sadio Mane. I'm like, wow, you're the best ever. You literally do that. Don't even say like it's nothing. Don't do that. <laughs> There's really nothing, Caesar. I just hate that a Boomerang video forever. That's the worst thing ever happened in my life. Is the Boomerang. Nacho might be blacker than uh, Sadio Mane? Don't play with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not just blacker than John Jones. Ooh, um, <laughs> Bayern Munich versus PSG. That's going to be an interesting one. Um, Very. Obviously, with Lewandowski out, that's a big blow for Bayern Munich. I seen somebody. I okay. I seen somebody in the PSG talk. Let me let me look at this really fast because. Okay, okay. Um, I guess Marco Verratti is going to be out too. Mm-hmm. I seen somebody saying that Verratti being out for PSG is worse than Lewandowski being out for Bayern Munich. I'm like, I literally. You just should like, never talk soccer again because oh. one guy's like leading the world in goals. You fool! What are you talking about? He has like fifty some stupid number. He has some bonkers number. Like, Granny scoring like five hundred against who knows what, but yeah, like he has like the most goals on the planet right now. What are you talking about? Like. I'm like, dog, like, you're comparing Lewandowski to someone who, like, every once in a while, he plays really good. Like, every He's once really in a while. Really good. Yeah, every once in a while, though. But it's literally every once in a while. And also, like, who's the backup striker for Bayern Munich? Chupa Moting, I think. Who's the backup midfielder for PSG? That's a lot of fools. A lot of homies up there. And, and also, Neymar is coming back. So, even, yeah. so, like, even when Neymar is back, he kind of, like, takes away from what Verratti does because Neymar, Neymar dominates the ball. So yeah, like, and Verratti likes to even go up that left side a little bit with the ball dribble and holding possession. That's like Neymar's area too. So, yeah, it takes away from that. Like, you, you have two possession-dominant players then, so yeah. Neymar's going to negate the other one. Yeah, exactly. So, it's like you can't even get the best of Verratti with Neymar out there. Like yeah, Verratti's going to play a lot more deeper anyways. Yeah, yeah, and he's been playing a little bit closer to goals uh, with Neymar out. But if he wasn't, then he's going to be playing back. And I feel like Verratti is a bit of a liability defensively. So, like, I, I, but but as far as Bayern Munich striker, like like anybody who's going to play center forward, really, I feel like it's Chupo Moting is like the backup for Lewandowski. I'm sure they can rearrange things in a way. Yeah, and maybe- they have like some like Dutch kid too that's good or whatever. He's like some tall Dutch kid. Like really? They don't really have. They don't have like a like. Yeah, Chupa Moting is their like, they're like prominent uh, backup role striker. Yeah, which, which I'm not mad at. But we all we, PSG knows what it is. You know, that's yes. really funny. Chupa Moting goes to Bayern Munich. Who he has to go against? <laughs> Hilarious. Um, uh, how 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 does fate work? But um uh yeah um personally for me I mean I know we don't really do picks. I got PSG kind of taking this one. Well, you think uh, only better? based. To be fair, only based on a Lewandowski result, I think still Bayern Munich has a stupid team. I mean, it's pretty dumb that team they have. It's bonkers. Um, you know, when you have uh, uh, Sane and um, uh, the home man and all these dudes all playing, um, sure. But like with Lewandowski, that was crazy. Like, that's not fair that the striker there gets like some of the best wingers in the world around him. Um, and of course, Sergio, the weekend Narby's there. So, that, that's great. But now that he's gone, I think that's, that's a bigger impact than people, I think, understand. And anybody that knows playing any kind of, like, watching it as the sport, whenever you're big, like, you're, you're the man leaves your team, it has some kind of effect on you. And if you don't have time to build off that and, and you're going into a Champions League heater, yeah. And I know everybody at Byron is so mad at international break right now. Oh, my God. They oh, hate yeah. it so much. <laughs> every time, there's always one player every year that they go, oh, my God, look what happened again. <laughs> um, Bayern is playing Leipzig on Saturday. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that might be a good test for them to see, like, how they operate without Lewandowski. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, honestly, and they're, like, a pretty quick team, too. That's a good one, too. Like, yeah. they play pretty up pace, too. That'd be mm-hmm. good for you. Yeah, that 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 that's a good test. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, that, that, that might kind of 
prepare them to play without Lewandowski in a good way against PSG. And they'll see how Chubo is and all that stuff and the adjustments and all that. What if Chubo gets like four goals? That'd be so dope. <laughs> I mean, I feel like Lev- Lewandowski is not one of those players that like, like he's – I, this is going to sound weird, but I feel like one of the big advantages of Lewandowski is that he's really flexible. He's really good at like wrapping his foot around the ball from like really like difficult angles. Um, like he seems like somebody that can like stretch his leg, like all the way up here, like a gymnast or something like that. Yeah. Uh, because he's not overly fast. He's not overly mm-hmm. athletic. He's not, you know, his movement is just, it's, it's the same as most strikers. Like, it's not anything like, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. He gets a, he gets the he's ball. He's not, like, a particularly fun to watch. He's not, like, bonkers or anything. Yeah, yeah. He, gets the, he gets a lot of service. Like, he gets way more service than a lot of center forwards. I think, like, some teams aren't accustomed to playing with the center forward, but Bayern Munich is because he's been there for forever. But I feel like the thing about him that I've noticed, and it sounds weird, obviously, but it's, like, He's obviously he's really good both feet, but like just really like flexible. Like I don't know, it, it sounds crazy, but I've, I've noticed that about him. I agree, and I think he's he's a true top talented tier stri- finisher. That's a real finisher yeah. right there. Mm-hmm. You know, you get to the final third. That's the man that you need to keep out of the box, right? That's the issue. That if I'm playing defense on him, it's about trying to make his entry the most difficult entry of all time, and. Yeah. You know, when I'm watching him play, they're just letting him scoot in and then marking him when he's already in his position. It's kind of like in basketball. You don't you want to just make it impossible for him to set up. And he just gets to set up. And when you let that kind of guy set up, he has two feet that are equal. <laughs> and it's just over. Such as that one goal he had on the goalie where, he, like, he confused him because he, like, kicked it on the left side with his left foot, which is not really what a right, right-footed person would do. He can do that. Like, it's it's not really an issue for him. So, very good, and they're going to be missing that. You know, it's it's it, that's that kind of player you can rely on, and he's he's the kind of guy that can start off with a barn burner, right? Like he's had plenty of games, so he'll start off the game in the first twenty minutes with like three zero. I'm like, oh my god, that's because he catches you sleeping. Like he's mm-hmm. really good. Yeah, and he's and he's got really good close control. He's a good dribbler and stuff. Um, yeah, I, it'll be an interesting match. Neymar is back, but PSG is. Uh, I think they've lost seven matches in, in Liga uh, this season, which is, like, crazy. Um, but, you know, you'll have Mbappe, you'll have Neymar. Um, they'll have a match before the game, and we'll see. I think they're playing Lille on Friday, maybe. Um, but we'll see. Uh, what was the last one? Oh, Porto versus Chelsea. <sighs> Great. Sounds Nobody. good. Who, who did they hire? Oh, two shell. That's right. Yeah. Um, anyway, the huh? The all blues. So a few teams have in during these uh, World Cup qualifiers in Europe. A few teams have been protesting against the human rights uh, situation in regards to migrant workers in Qatar who will be hosting the World Cup next season, next year. Um, inshallah, if we don't have a different, co- if we don't have COVID twenty one popping, then, um, but they're saying. I mean, obviously, we talked about it a little bit. Um, they're saying that over sixty five hundred migrant workers have died since two thousand ten, when Qatar won the World Cup. They're talking about intense heat and different things. So a few of the um, U- European national teams: uh, Norway, Netherlands, Germany. They put on their shirts, um, they put like something about human rights on and off the pitch on their shirts before the match um, in protest to what they see as a problem in Qatar. I think Tony Cruz actually came out and talked about it. Um, it was really funny because I was like looking at one of the tweets, I think like Goal tweeted about it. And uh, some of the people in the mentions were like, <laughs> they were like, yeah, but you didn't, see, you thought Ozil was tripping when he said there was racism in the, in the German national team. He's like, why didn't you stand up for Ozil? And then somebody put uh, Tony Cruz strikes again. They put like K K K R O O S. <laughs> I was like, damn. I'm like, are y'all being racist because he was born in East Germany? But anyway, oh. um, it's an interesting situation. And I'm just going to say this really fast because this is supposed to be a 17-minute episode. Hour and 17. (laughs) I 
You know, sometimes it's tough to talk about what's going on in another country. Like you're dealing with some level of speculation. But I like, let's say it's true that the working, the working, um, st that the work standards in the in Qatar are not great. It's damn slavery, and people are dying, falling off of buildings, having heat strokes, and the and the like. One is the responsibility of FIFA. When 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 Qatar won that contract, FIFA, you need to be there monitoring things. You got plenty of money. Send somebody there to see that what the hell's going on. And you should have discussed that beforehand. Um, not and I'm not giving Qatar a pass for that, but it's like, what's FIFA doing? Like, are y'all like, are why does the Guardian have to report on it? FIFA should be there as an organization making sure things are kosher. But also. The USA is the is the great Satan, man. Like USA is worse than everybody. Like I'm sorry, dude. Like you're talking about human rights. Qatar never invaded nobody. Like I'm sorry, dude. Like I can't sit up there and be like, oh well, yeah. It seems like it's bad when I know that like USA literally invaded Iraq and like a million people died. Like we're just gonna forget. <laughs> like during those World Cups, too, the stuff was going on. Caesar, I, I, you know, I, I, I remember like 2006 World Cup. I remember asking myself, literally back then, I'm like, damn, like if I was on the U.S. Men's National Team, could I play? I'm like, I wonder if I would like boycott and be like, I'm not going to play when I, my country is doing this, these terrible things. Like, I can't even imagine. Like you got to put that shirt on and do the Pledge of Allegiance. It's a lot, like. Really, dude, right now we're kind of murdering people. I used to watch, uh, I used to watch, they used to put a camera in Fallujah on the building and it would just show, like, and it was Al Jazeera, which is based in Qatar. They used to have a camera on a building in, in Fallujah and they would just show over the weeks, all, everything was just turned into rubble. Like you, like you said, like one day it's like, okay, like there's a few, there's some, there's a lot of buildings. And the next week, Okay, there are a few, a few less. The next week, like, damn, like there's like three buildings left. The next week is like literally turned to rubble. And the worst part is that, for what? At the end, what did what did we do it for? What to be an uh, evil? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm saying like that. It, that's that's when you want to protest human rights atrocities, right? Because the USA went in there, and where where was it? Where was where, where was what we're looking for? Exactly. It didn't, it wasn't there. And that all went down and tons and tons of people died. It's still dying because of that. Still yeah, dying because of that. And, and it's all good, right? Because time went by. It's all good because it's USA. No. So I just think it's like, well, look, 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 go look, finish your point. Finish your point. Finish your point. I'm it, sorry. This, this whole thing, no, it's fine. Not. This whole thing seems just like, it just seems kind of fugazi and orchestrated. Another thing, where was all this about uh, Qatar when they're putting them on the shirts? When they're putting, Qatar is like an official thing for Bayern Munich, like their official flyer or whatever. Qatar is all over everything in soccer. What, what are we talking about? Like, are we really going to start talking about countries being bad when it comes to sports? Like, we got to, you can't just single out uh, places. It'd be like, oh yeah, well this one's bad, but you know, this one's okay. Got that like, airways. Like, would 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 Tony Cruz uh, play in Israel? Would he would he just be fine with that? Okay, oh Germany's got to play Israel in the qualifiers. Would you be having something to say about Is that? Is Tony Cruz gonna wear a shirt that says "Visit Maccabi"? Is he gonna wear that? <laughs> Is he gonna rock that? No, is he? Because he he just cares so much about vi human rights violations. All of a sudden, the German national team irony wants to just be the human rights saviors of the planet. It's really cute. You want to step up now. You want to step up and start talking now, right? That's cute. And this is what you want to pick out on. Qatar, it's great. You know what? It's great to go against Qatar because out of all the places they picked recently, that's the easiest one, right? That's the one where no one's going to flip out, right? You attack the South Africa, when people are going to go, whoa, man, why, 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 why would you do that? Why South Africa? You, you go at uh, Korea, whatever, Japan, whoa, after all, what those countries do to whales and, and, and fish populate, whatever, oh, whoa, hey, man, why are you doing it about them? 
But Qatar, everybody in the world, a lot of people in the world, sadly, can just easily agree with you. Without doing proper research, without FIFA, the largest sporting, FIFA is so large, they're bigger than most countries in terms of money and everything. And it, then they should be incumbent on FIFA for this. Don't come at it. Don't, don't go to FIFA and then say, voice your concerns during that entire selection process. You're going to turn up the heat when we're about to get there? Is that, is that how you work? Is that how you, you weren't mad the last damn near five years because they delayed it before. Now you're mad, homie? Like, you weren't mad when the discussion I had originally the issue was just about the time period they're going to have it. I'm like, dog, like, you can't have it in the summer there. You're, you're crazy. Like, what are we doing here? Like, are they going to, is it going to be like the video game outpost where everybody's walking through like air conditioning tubes and then it's in an enclosed dome? Okay, cool. But that's not the case. I saw some open stadiums. I was like, okay, man. So, uh, whoa, whoa now. <laughs> so, you know, they're talking about moving into the winter and all that stuff. Fine. But now you're talking about human rights. Like I said, I, I hate to say this, Germany, Germany does is continue doing a lot of really good progressive things for a lot of people in the world. That's great. They do a lot of stuff. They're for their own German people. They do a lot of good things too. But and I do like the prime minister. Great. The, uh, but chancellor, chancellor. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, hard to keep up with all these titles. Um, I wasn't born here. But it's just funny when you want to come sideways already right now. Like you didn't check earlier. You didn't check when it started off. It's like you procrastinated your passion, right? You decided to procrastinate your passion to when it just started. I, that I don't like that. It wasn't like Germany's had a consistent undertone since the beginning of this. It wasn't like, you know what, even beginning when they started doing qualifiers, Germany has been upset since the first qualifier. Now, now Menz is, is upset about it. So I think that's kind of really weak. Um, I think that a lot of players are doing a lot of talking without, I don't know if they're doing proper research. You seem to have a lot of time in your hands. You're doing heavy research on the ground of how the Qatar stadiums are being built. Maybe Qatar was scared the whole time of this happening to them, and they didn't take those steps. You don't know. But I would love there for be a proper independent investigation team to find out this kind of stuff beforehand. Maybe make Qatar sign contracts, blah, 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 adhering to this. This stuff we need to know. That's more on FIFA's handling. FIFA needs to be handling independent things. You can have their own people there on the ground. They need to be monitoring uh, workers and how it is because FIFA likes to go into these countries and build and, and have these stadiums being hosted because they want to give an opportunity to the, the less – uh, fortunate countries, right? Not the not the big European USA's, even though you're doing a three country World Cup. You want to do this stuff to spread the game more, right? But that means you got to be there for the process. You got to invest in it yourself too. So, I don't know, man. I don't know. It just it just I'm down for you, you guys being upset, but the whole protest thing, you're being extra because you're doing that now. Like I don't like that part. I don't like that part of it. It, it just doesn't feel grassroots. It just feels like it doesn't made. feel. It doesn't feel real. You know what I'm saying? Like you know when something's real, you'd be like, you know what? That's dope. And I don't even have anything against Cruz and them. Like, but it just feels kind of weird because I'm like, you, you kind of play for club. Both of you play for clubs with other countries on there too. There's fine varieties and cut that airways. Like, like what? Like, is it like oh, you're mad now? I don't understand. Like, are you like like who made those shirts? Like, 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 and it, like, you're wearing Adidas cleats. Where do you think those are produced, homie? Like it's just it's just like it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like a grassroots protest. I remember after um, the Lazio fans were putting up like anti-Semitic things about Roma fans and putting up them and Frank anti-Semitic stuff. The next week, the Lazio players were wearing like Anne Frank shirts and they like there was like a whole thing. But that was a reaction to something that happened. This thing seems like it just seems like somebody else got you guys to do this thing, and. It just like I said, it's like, a difference between reaction and then procrastination. This feels like it's about to get started, so now I'm upset. Well, they're, I don't think they're upset. I just feel like somebody was like, hey, like, we're going to do this campaign. They're like, okay, like, all right, sure. Like, like they probably didn't even have a choice. Like, yeah. Probably one of the players over there watching YouTube videos and got mad. Well, I no, don't doubt that either. I'm sure it was higher than that because it's like somebody in the Federation, I'm sure. But it's just like, it doesn't feel like it's a grassroots thing. When it's a protest, it should be like something from the people and it should be something from the players, whatever. But all I know is that, well, Qatar is saying that they only, there's been only 35 deaths, uh, work-related deaths. And like the other thing is saying there's been 6,500. So we'll meet in the middle. No, I'm just joking. But, um, well, that's a big number there. But 
<laughs> either way, like, you know, That's it's just crazy. tough because it's like, yeah, you're dealing with nations and if there's not going to be a level, if there's not going to be real transparency, like you can't rely on a country to tell you what's going on. Like you got to send in somebody like an, in, like FIFA should have somebody there monitoring the situation, making sure everything is going well. They should have that for, um, for, you know, Mexico in the seventies, have it for Brazil, have it for South Africa, have it for Russia, have it for Germany, have it for the, Euro, like any place where they're having to do like this amount of like preparation have somebody there. So like, it, it, like if, if it's 6,500, yes, Qatar is to blame, but it's like, yo, like, what do you think countries do? Qatar is not like some big nation with all this power that you can like, like you can put pressure on Qatar. Like Qatar got a whole damn boycott of a blockade for years. And they also have the biggest US military base in the region in Qatar. So like, it's not like FIFA couldn't put pressure on Qatar. Like, how many countries would have taken that World Cup from Qatar? Like, how many countries? If you tell a country right now, hey, you got, you got, uh, 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 Caesar's distracted. Um, if you tell a country right now, like, hey, you won this 20, 2022 World Cup, yes. So it would have been very easy to be like, look, Qatar, we're going to give you this World Cup, but like, you got to make sure you're not having slaves come from Pakistan and Bangladesh, okay? Yeah. They're already here, but if they're working on these stadiums, you got you to gotta make sure they have breaks. Yeah, and, and, and like you said, is it about protesting how you feel about it? Or are you trying to enable, like, you should be bringing about an alternative to the solution. What's the solution to fix this issue? You should be saying, I'm going to protest this un unless people can send actual people on the ground to assess the real, co the real death rate. Assess how we can move forward to 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 building this safely for people and for fans. Like that's what the approach needs to be. Not like, oh man, you gave it to them. The hell no, they've done all kind of bad stuff, buddy. Man, we don't we don't want to check receipts on countries now, do we? <laughs> we don't want to be checking receipts now, do we? So let's just relax a little bit. Some countries in this world have gotten away with a lot, and and it's and it's. The last thing I'm going to be doing, especially even me as being an American citizen of America, I'm going to be trying to be checking on how other countries acting. It's funny to do that. So I just yeah. don't, I, I don't, I don't, like you said, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel, it doesn't feel from the heart. You know, it feels different. Mexico, Canada, USA got the 2026 World Cup. Mexico is one of the most dangerous countries for journalists. USA is the great Satan. And Canada over here uh, uh, polluting the world with uh, oil, uh, with, uh, with fossil fuels. So, uh, you know what I mean? Like, like, nobody has a great track record when it comes to a country. You, you can't be a country and be completely great. Like, I'm sorry, yeah. dude. Everybody has their problems. It's, it's the, the foundation of countries itself. And it, it all started with war. Everything was started off with some kind of battle or something in history. It's part of human history. So, yeah. I'm not going to do this die on a hill for this kind of thing, but... Yeah, I just think that it's whack. I mean, you're not. Are you over here complaining about your travel schedule when you're going to play USA, Canada, Mexico, or what? Are you going to talk about the greenhouse emissions you guys are going to do from all the flying you're going to be doing between playing in Mexico City to Montreal? No, you're not doing that, right? You're not upset about that, are you? Keep spreading emissions to murder generations. That's a problem too. Try that one. You feel me? Um, but you know who? Yeah, Two-hour episode. You you know who did talk about it? We made a podcast. We made a podcast. It and. Three years from now, when we're still two viewers and, and 600 episodes, they're going to be repeating what we're saying three years ago. <laughs> um, okay. Also, um, I don't know if you want to mention this on the podcast or not, but um, if anybody's listening, um, and I would imagine that nobody's listening this late, but um, Caesar and I are both, today is the 31st of March. Um, on the 2nd of April and on the 3rd of April, Caesar and I are both getting our second doses of vaccines, Caesar's getting that right here. Caesar getting that young Moderna, and I'm getting that young Pfizer. Oh, oh you got yeah. Pfizer. Yeah. Okay, Caesar getting that young. I just had 100 percent recently. Let's go for kids. Um, getting that young Pfizer, and I'm getting that young Pfizer. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we were responsible. We will be suffering this weekend for sure. Um, we'll see. I got Amazon blood. We'll see. <sighs> okay. Um, but yeah. Just wanted to say that uh, we're we're doing the responsible thing, um, and every single episode we made it since last year, all virtual. 
Yes. Yes. Every and single will... episode since I... Man, I'm trying to check, like, wait a minute. Yeah. Every single episode has been virtual. And it will continue to be that way. Um... <laughs> it's really nice. Just in the episodes, get up, just do whatever I want. <laughs> Anyway, uh, We Made It Podcast, episode 196. If you're still here, do yourself a favor and go on Twitch and put in We Made It C's. And don't just follow. Don't just click that heart. Subscribe. Send them subs. And then when you hop in the chat, um, 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 uh, sub tier. So do some sub tiers for some other people in the chat. I guess I'm saying it right. I don't know. Uh, make sure that you are subbing uh, to C's because C's over there caking up. You got new cones. You got water now. He got two different. We got vitamin water and essential. C's are getting that that that's that baller water now. You know what I'm saying? Like he got two phones. He got a mic. He got a damn them lights around. Is this from sweeteners. I mean, uh, Switzerland. He got two uh, different air conditioners in his crib. You know what I'm saying? I do got. I, I got. I got rid of my fans. Life is good. He probably got the. He probably got the cord going out into some random uh, plug out there, so he don't got to pay that electric bill. I got somebody. so many TV subscriptions. Your boy doing good now. He, boy, he got probably got hey, tw- Max about to watch Godzilla. I thought he was gonna watch it all together. I'm See, kidding, dog. This t- <laughs> I'm telling Sergio. Anyway, episode one ninety six of the podcast. Do holler.